So in this video, we're going to look at the structure of the skin and give you kind of an introduction to that. And then also talk a little bit about burns and the way that we assess burns so that you can work on the activity that's included in this particular folder. The first thing that you should know about skin is it has two layers to it. So you can see these layers labeled over here on this diagram. The first one is what's known as the epidermis. So it's the upper layer. And I'm going to kind of try to draw the boundary of where the epidermis is here. So you'll notice that it's kind of sitting on top. It kind of has this jagged boundary between epidermis and what's below it, um, the dermis. And the reason for that is that kind of increases the surface area between these two layers and helps to bind them together because of that. The epidermis is composed of a stratified squamous epithelium. So now that we've finished up looking at tissues, you should be familiar with what a stratified squamous epithelium is. Basically, it's many, many layers of those flattened squamous shaped cells. Because the epidermis is an epithelium, so it's covering a body surface, right? Um, it is a vascular, meaning that it doesn't blood supply. And you'll notice if you look at it closely, that there aren't any blood vessels that actually penetrate all the way up into that stratified squamous epithelium that makes up the epidermis. One thing that we do see here, though, is it does have free nerve endings, and that's why you can sense things on your skin. You can sense changes in temperature um, and those kinds of things because you do have nerve endings that extend up into the epidermis. The second layer of the skin is the larger layer. So if you kind of look here, all of this that you're seeing in pink makes up what's known as the dermis. So if you think back to the tissue section, you'll remember that epithelial tissues like the epidermis always sit atop a layer of connective tissue. And the dermis is that, it's connective tissue. There's actually a couple of different types of connective tissue associated with the dermis. So one of these is the areolar connective tissue, which is really um, kind of loose and open, you may remember, and it makes it very, very good at cushioning. But the other type of connective tissue that we find in this particular layer of the skin is dense irregular. Dense irregular because it has those really strong collagen fibers that are running in all different directions through it. Um, tends to be a tissue that's very good at being stretched in all different directions and kind of snapping back into place. So if you think about the skin, it's very pliable, it's very capable of being stretched. You can stretch it out, it snaps back into place, at least when we're younger. Um, and that's because of the collagen that is contained within that um, dense, irregular connective tissue within the dermis itself. The dermis also contains blood vessels. So you can see those running pretty prolifically through this particular layer. Um, these blood vessels give their oxygen up to the tissues of the dermis and their nutrients. And then that oxygen and the nutrients have to diffuse up into the epidermis as well. So that's how the epidermis gets its nutrients. There's a third layer of tissue down here at the base. So you can see it in yellow. This is actually fat or adipose tissue. It's known as the hypodermis, which throws a lot of students off and I think makes them think it's a third layer of skin because we've got that word dermis in there. It is not considered to be a layer of skin, um, but I always like to mention it just because of the fact that a lot of students get confused on that point because it's called the Hypodermis and hypo, of course, really just means below the dermis, and it is the tissue that's sitting below the dermis and helping to connect it into underlying tissues. So we've had this really kind of brief introduction into the structure of the skin and the different layers that make it up. Your activity for this particular folder um, kind of builds on this to look at burns. So we're looking at what happens when there's damage to that structure of the skin. So a little bit about burns just in general. There are some different ways that we can classify burns. Probably the most common way is to classify them into first, second, and third degree burns. So I wanna talk about the least severe type of burn first, which is a first degree burn. If you look at that top picture in A, a sunburn is a good example of a first degree burn. So in these burns, um, usually, we just get some redness, right? Um, it's just that top layer of skin, the epidermis that's actually damaged. And these types of burns sometimes will peel, but tend to 
really do well healing on their own after some time. The next most severe type of burn is what's known as a second degree burn. So we've got a second degree burn represented um, in picture B. And one of the things that you may be able to make out about it is that there's actually a blister that has formed along with that burn. The reason that we get blisters forming with a second degree burn, and they are really the hallmark of second degree burns, is because a second degree burn is more severe than a first degree burn. We have damaged the epidermis with a second degree burn, but we have also damaged the dermis, and that's actually what causes those blisters to form. So I'm gonna to attempt to draw you a picture here that will explain why you get blisters forming with a second degree burn. Here's my very simplified representation of the upper layer of skin, the epidermis. So I'm putting an E there to represent that. And here's that lower layer of skin, the dermis, and I've got my D there to represent that. With a first degree burn, we've got damage only down into the epidermis, and just the epidermis is damaged. With a second degree burn, damage has penetrated through the epidermis, and now it's actually down in the dermis. And when that happens, remember that we've got blood vessels that are located in the dermis. So when we get damage to this tissue, those blood vessels actually start to leak fluids. And what happens when those blood vessels in the dermis leak fluids is we get this situation occurring. So here's the epidermis. Put an E in there just to represent that that's the epidermis. And below that, okay, we've got this dermal layer. Here's the dermis. And what happens when there's damage to the dermis is fluids start to leak out of those blood vessels, but the epidermis is actually impenetrable to fluids. So those fluids leak out of the dermis, they can't get through the epidermis, and they sit in this layer right here and kind of separate the epidermis and the dermis from each other. That's what a blister is, and that's why blisters are a hallmark of a second degree burn, because now you've actually got dermal damage and the indication that there's a blister there lets you know that uh, dermal damage has occurred. So the most severe type of burn when we're using the first, second, third degree classification uh, scheme is what's known as a third degree burn. If you look at the picture in C, we've got a third degree burn represented. With a third degree burn, the epidermis is basically obliterated. Um, the dermis is basically obliterated as well. The hypodermis may be destroyed and we may have even burned down into lower tissues like muscles, tendons, ligaments, bones, those kinds of things. But when you've got a burn where the epidermis and the dermis have both been completely destroyed, now you're dealing with the third degree burn. First degree burns tend to heal really well on their own. Second degree burns tend to heal really well on their own as long as you don't get infection. Um, but third degree burns do not. And the reason that third degree burns do not heal on their own because the stem cells that would be capable of replacing damaged skin are located around hair follicles in the skin. So those hair follicles are embedded in the dermis. If you damage the dermis, if you destroy the dermis, which is the case with a third degree burn, you've destroyed the stem cells and that prevents those stem cells from being able to replace the skin. So what we wanna do with this last slide is talk a little bit about the rule of nines. Um, this is a system that's used to assess burns and to analyze burns and to plan for treatment for burn victims. So you may have heard video reports or news reports where it says that this person had some terrible thing happen to them and they had 30% of their body covered in third degree burns. This is how we would calculate what percentage of the body is covered in third degree burns. So to give you um, just kind of a brief background on what the rule of nines does, basically it divides the body into regions. So you can see these regions over here in this diagram divided up. So the front side of the body is divided up separately from the back side of the body. And each of these regions is assigned to be 9% or some multiple of 9% of the total surface area. With that in mind, if somebody comes in and they have third degree burns on the anterior trunk, so the anterior trunk's covered with third degree burns, and the anterior 
uh, right arm is covered with burns. You really quickly add those numbers up. So 18 plus 4.5 percent is 22.5 percent. Um, again, if you had burns on the anterior trunk, which is 18 percent, and the anterior right arm, which is 4.5, as well as the posterior arm, which is another 4.5, now you've got um, third degree burns over 27 percent of the body. So it's just a real quick, simple way to kind of add these up and get an indication of where a burn victim is at when they come in. There are a lot of different diagrams out there for calculating the rule of nines. There's charts for children um, that are different from charts for adults. You could really go down kind of a Google rabbit hole. Um, so what I would suggest doing when you're working with this in the activity that you do this week is to use the chart that I give you. That will simplify it and still give you what you need to understand about the rule of nines and ensure that you're getting the right answers. So why then do we need to know the extent of a burn when a patient comes in? There's a couple of reasons why. So the first thing is your skin is probably the most important thing to the functioning of your immune system. It does probably more than any other system in the body to keep you healthy. And that's because it's a very, very good barrier to microorganisms that are all over your skin. Basically, those microorganisms stay out of your body because of the skin, and because of that, most of them never get the opportunity to actually make you sick. Another thing that skin does is it's very, very good at keeping the internal contents and especially the fluids of your body inside of your body. So it helps you to maintain fluid balance and electrolyte balance in your body. It helps you to stay healthy. Basically, what it does is it keeps the good things in and it keeps the bad things out. When you have a third degree burn, remember that you have completely burned through the epidermis and the dermis. Those are gone and basically what you've lost is this membrane that keeps the good stuff in you, the fluids and the electrolytes, and it keeps the bad stuff out of you. So one of the biggest problems, things that people die of when they have extensive third degree burns is they get an infection because they've lost that membrane and now all sorts of microorganisms are able to get into the body or they get super dehydrated and start having electrolyte problems because they're losing so many fluids or both. That's what leads to death typically for burn patients is those two situations there. So if we can very quickly kind of measure what's the extent of the burn, then we know how many fluids and electrolytes we have to replace. Um, we can at least get an estimate of that. The other thing is, remember that third degree burns do not heal on their own. So if you have a relatively large third degree burn, you're going to be looking at a skin graft. And sometimes if the burn is not too big, they can take a graft from your own body. So they'll take healthy skin from somewhere else and they'll just kind of stretch it over the burned area and that's the best possible situation because that's your tissue and your immune system is not going to react against it. However, if you have really extensive burns, sometimes there's not enough healthy tissue on the body to be able to remove it and stretch it over a burned area. And when that's the case, now we need to start looking at either getting a membrane from a cadaver to put over it, um, a skin transplant of some kind, or looking at an artificial membrane um, to place over the skin as well. And knowing basically how much of the skin is severely burned allows us to be able to plan for those skin grafts and determine what's the best type of skin graft for a burn victim.